Chapter 8 Henry, help me! Leah screamed through the clash of metal and the screams of the dying. How did she get here? Henry thought as he knocked down his opponent and raced toward her. Before he had gone ten steps, another enemy appeared and brought him up short. This enemy he knew very well. Patrick? Henry demanded. What are you doing? Move aside. But Patrick only stood there, his sword held at the ready, his lifeless eyes showing no emotion. Leah screamed again. Henry quickly disarmed the young man and attempted to push past him, but Patrick wrapped his arms around Henry and clung to him. Henry was shocked by the youth's weight. He could hardly move. He tried to disentangle himself from the boy, but they only became more tied up as he struggled. Leah screamed again, and Henry watched as a man in white picked her up and spirited her into the crowds of dying men. Henry screamed in frustration, but he could not seem to get past Patrick in order to reach her. He looked down at his burden and found himself staring directly into Patrick's dead eyes. Patrick stared silently back at him. He uttered no word, made no sound. It was as if... as if he were dead. Henry sat bolt upright in bed. He threw the bedclothes off and stumbled to the window for reassurance that what he knew to be a dream was just that, nothing more than a dream. He had dozed off while awaiting the start of the feast his mother was holding in his honor, and the dreams had returned here, too. He had not been able to stop these terrible dreams since that fateful battle, and he awoke each morning feeling more exhausted than when he had retired. The specter of Patrick he was used to, but Leah was a new addition. Returning home was stirring up many old emotions he had thought gone forever. Turning from the window, he found his tunic and draped it over his bare shoulders. The last thing in the world he felt up to was socializing, but he knew it was expected. His mother was not doing this to inconvenience him. She was doing it to honor him, and he was obligated to play the gracious recipient. He sat on the bed and rested his arms on his knees. How could he go into a room full of people celebrating his return when all those who rode with him, who depended on him, were left lying in the dirt of a distant land? How could he look into his family's eyes? How could he look into the eyes of his friends, into Leah's eyes, and not see the reflection of his own guilt? Surely they must all think him a coward. Was that what they would see? Was that what he was? His head was in his hands when a knock came at the door. Sir Henry, it was Sebastian, the head servant at Donning Castle since before Henry was born. The guests are all assembled. Have you made yourself ready? Henry suddenly realized he was only half-dressed. I, uh, I will be ready momentarily, Sebastian. Very good, Sir Henry. Henry quickly laced up his silk tunic and pulled on the soft boots the servants had left for him. He had his sword belt halfway buckled when he remembered himself. A weapon had no place in a formal celebration. The finery of court felt strange after three years of armor, but not half so strange as not having a weapon on him. That just seemed foolhardy. I am never going to get used to this, he said aloud. Another knock on the door roused him. Henry opened it and followed the silver-haired Sebastian into the hallway and down to the main dining hall that was set in formal regalia for this occasion. The hall was full and everyone stopped and turned when the servant at the door announced Henry. A thunderous applause went up from those assembled and Henry crimsoned. All his life he had been imagining this moment, his triumphal return after his glorious crusade yet it all seemed so hollow to him now. It was as though everyone was merely pretending he was a hero so he would not know that they thought him a lowly coward, like he felt. Martha Donning met him at the door. She was wearing a slightly more formal dark gown than she customarily wore. Her widow's cap was still perched on her head, but now it was set atop hair that was pulled up in a tight knot. She seemed older than Henry remembered. She hunched slightly as if the weight on her shoulders had stooped them. The skin on her aging face hung more loosely than he remembered, and the lines were deeper. For the first time, Henry found himself wondering if she had been beautiful as a younger woman. To him, she had always just been his mother, and was what she was, but now he wondered how others saw her. She put her arm through his. "'Smile, dear,' she muttered through lips that did not move. "'You look like you are attending a funeral.' Henry forced a smile as the assembled guests started forward to greet him. I am very proud of you, his mother whispered to him before they were surrounded by a sea of well-wishers. 
Roland was the first welcome face that Henry picked out among the many assembled. Roland, Henry cried. It is good to see you, Henry, he grinned foolishly. Roland was tall, skinny, and usually uncomfortable in his own skin. Henry embraced him impulsively and then stepped back, embarrassed. Thomas was the next significant face to appear from the crowd. He stepped forward and dissolved the awkward moment. "'Welcome home, little brother,' Thomas said with a great bear hug that squeezed the breath from his much thinner younger brother. Under Thomas's powerful grip, a series of successive poppy noises rattled up Henry's back. "'There,' Thomas said, grinning. "'I just put you right.' "'I think that was the sound of my ribs cracking,' Henry said with forced good humor. "'It might have been,' Thomas laid a meaty hand on Henry's arm. "'You did not fatten up a bit over there.' "'I had one or two other items to occupy my time,' Henry told him. "'More important than food?' Thomas said in his customary loud voice. He was an entertainer in a room full of people, so he was always careful that everyone could hear what he had to say. He slapped his belly. There is always time for food. He laughed loudly, and Henry couldn't help but laugh along. His irreverent attitude was infectious. Then she was there. Breaking through the line surrounding Henry, he could not keep from gawking. He remembered Leah's attractive, but if she was beautiful before, she was stunning now. Time had transformed the pretty young girl into a breathtaking woman. She wore a pink dress that had a series of ties running from the waist to just beneath her perfectly formed chest. Her brown hair was pulled back on the sides, cascading down past her shoulders. There was a strand of hair hanging carelessly in her hazel eyes, as it always seemed to. Henry drank in her beauty, his resolutions of the last three years concerning Leah temporarily forgotten. All her features, even the ever-so-faint spray of freckles across her nose, seemed more vivid. Henry paused to compose himself. Leah stood demurely, not wanting to intrude on his reunion with his family, and that made her even more irresistible. "'Milady,' he said formally, "'I thank you for troubling yourself over such a trivial matter as this.' He took her hand and kissed it. "'I would not have missed it, Sir Henry,' she said in her customary guileless manner. Henry could not fathom this woman. If their roles had been reversed, he would not have set foot anywhere near Donning Castle. But here she was, and she seemed just as happy to be here as if nothing untoward had ever passed between them. Was that an indication of something else? Some shift in her feelings, he wondered. Trivial thing, Thomas interrupted. And what about all the time and trouble of those assembled here do you consider trivial? Very nice, brother, Henry said sardonically. I shall tell you what had better not be trivial, he said. Dinner! Thomas rubbed his hands together as he surveyed the room full of servants piling the tables high with all manner of fruits and meats. Mother, I am wasting away to nothing. Did you intend on eating that food or only looking at it? I thought Henry was going to have to change his leggings, Thomas said and the table roared with laughter. Henry colored in embarrassment but tried to appear unruffled. The feast at Donning Court in Henry's honor passed off smoothly. Most of the nobles and knights of Donning Court were in attendance. Thomas, as usual, played a prominent part in the evening's entertainment with his boisterous jests and his larger-than-life personality. Henry often wished he were more like Thomas. Thomas could make people laugh so easily. Henry had tried on occasion to employ that same flippant attitude about life, but it was just not him, and he invariably ended up offending people. Thomas also tended to get too carried away, but somehow these gatherings never seemed to be complete without him. Henry enjoyed watching his old friends and family back together. Sitting in the warmth of the company, he told himself that the nightmares that had haunted him for the last few weeks were just that, nightmares and nothing more. But despite the fun and laughter, there was one person halfway down the central table that kept his attention for most of the evening. Leah captivated him. Every movement, every word, every note of her light musical laugh stirred his heart. Why is she here? he mused silently. Of course, where else would she be? But could it be that she is actually here simply to show her support with no ulterior motive? Only a devil could seem so angelic. As the evening wore on, most of the friends, family, and well-wishers began to make their way out. Eventually, even Martha Donning, having said farewells to the last of the guests, retired for the evening. She exited by giving Henry a peck on his forehead. 
Henry sat in the mostly empty dining hall watching the servants scurrying about while cleaning up the remnants of the repast. He noted that Edith, Leah's handmaid, had momentarily disappeared. Leah rose to go also. Um, milady, Henry said formally, standing to address her, I wonder if you would not tarry for a moment. Of course, Sir Henry, she said, betraying no hint of what thought she might be hiding behind her eyes. She dutifully took the seat to the right of the head of the table where Henry again seated himself. I trust the intervening years have kept you well, Henry said. It was maddening to be so awkward with the one person in the world he most wanted to be close to. I have been very well. Although, she said sweetly, it has been rather quiet with the dawning men all but absent. Henry searched her words for some sign of something other than plain good breeding, some indication of deference to him. Yes, well, such is the life of a knight. His destiny is not his own, he said philosophically. Oh, please do not take my selfish expressions as reproof. My pleasure in your noble family's willingness to serve the Pope's divine cause is equaled only by my joy at your safe return. Was that it? Henry wondered urgently. Did that comment hint at some special regard she nurtured for him, or was that simply Leah being sweet? He chewed his lip thoughtfully as he tried to work out how best to proceed. Sir Henry, Leah prodded gently. Hmm? Oh, sorry. I was just reflecting on my time serving the Pope's divine cause. He could not entirely keep the bitterness out of his voice as he echoed her expression. Leah hesitated for a moment. Are you quite well? He was not at all well, but he could not tell her the real reason for it. At least, not yet. It is only that phrase, the Pope's divine cause, that gave me pause, he admitted. While this was not the primary matter on his mind, real doubts about this very subject had been plaguing him since the day of his defeat at Cresson. When you left, I had never known a more fervent desire in any man to do the Lord's will, Leah said. Has something happened to tarnish that? Henry snorted. Has something happened? Nothing at all except being abandoned by the Lord while I watch my men slaughtered around me. Leah's hand came to her mouth. "'Surely you still believe in the divine nature of your calling to serve in the crusade,' she said. "'You must know that there was a reason for the work you were undertaking.' "'What was the reason for my entire company being wiped out in Jerusalem?' Henry was suddenly heated as he delved into the terrible fear, resentment, and guilt he was carrying with him since Cresson. "'I imagine the reason were superior numbers. As I understand it, your men were outnumbered. Is that not correct?' "'Why should that matter?' If I was on God's errand, why was he not with me? Why was he not with us when we needed him most? Like ancient Israel defeating Canaan with three hundred soldiers. If those old legends are true, where was he when we needed him? I think perhaps you are confusing God's approval with destiny, she said gently. God wants us to reclaim the Holy Land from the Saracens, but if I were to try to take it alone, I should not prevail. She hesitated, afraid she would sound like she was accusing Henry of some miscalculation or wrongdoing. It is incumbent upon us to be adequately prepared for the challenge at hand. And if the Lord wants to use us to make a point as he did in Jericho, so be it. But it is far more common in Scripture that the blood of the righteous make the more poignant point. Well, that may be, but I am certain that my men died for nothing. Though they were acting in the service of God, they are just as dead as they would have been if they were acting on selfish or evil designs. We lost every bit of ground we had fought for, and their bodies were burned on a foreign land by unclean hands. Their lives were wasted. It saddens me to hear you speak of your sacrifices wasted, Leah said with genuine emotion. No life given in the service of the Lord is ever wasted, and we expect that those soldiers were received to the bosom of the Lord for their sacrifice. You are aware, I trust, that the Moors use that same language to justify themselves. They are saying that they are being received to the bosom of Allah for their service and defeat in battle. Whom shall I believe? Whom shall you believe? Leah asked incredulously. Sir Henry, the Lord has seen fit to spare your life. I, for one, am very grateful for that, but rather than evoking a heightened sense of gratitude and greater devotion to God as one might expect, your experiences seem to have embittered you. How can this be? 
Are you so certain I was spared by divine intervention? Henry challenged. Were you present on the field? Was I carried to safety in a heavenly cloud blown by a divine wind? Or did I fight through the day, and only when my last men were being cut down did I flee from the field like a cowardly dog? He slammed the table with his fist and jumped to his feet. What is divine about that? He walked a few paces away and stood brooding. The silence was palpable. Is it the loss of your men and the defeat that is gnawing at your soul? Leah asked softly. Or is it the fact that you were forced to flee? It is everything. We were supposed to be divine warriors that swept the enemy before us. But instead we were like lambs at the slaughter. Do you believe your call to crusade was divine? Leah asked again. No, I do not believe it was divine, Henry yelled in exasperation. Nothing about the experience was sacred. It was abysmal, dark, and horrible. I would never go back, and I would never do it again. Leah did not respond. As Henry calmed down, he realized that he had just accomplished the exact opposite of what he had set out to do. Instead of letting the sweet, beautiful creature know that he still cherished feelings for her, he was using her as an outlet for his most lurid thoughts. He dropped his eyes in shame. He had surprised even himself by vocalizing his doubts of the church's divinity and the correctness of the crusades, but he did not regret saying them. Expressing the pain he was in and the horror of that day was cathartic for Henry. He felt justified in lashing out against the organization that had put him in such a dire situation, but realized now that Leah may take it as lashing out against her. "'Forgive me, my lady, he said, seating himself once more. It was awkward now that his anger had passed, and he rushed to remove the discomfort. I suppose I did not realize how hard on me the ordeal had been. Leah was silent for a moment. It must have been truly terrible. Henry only nodded. Edith reappeared through the doors that led to the kitchen and servant's side of the house, and with her arrival, Henry's opportunity evaporated. He had wasted his moment. He stood formally to remove the appearance of any impropriety. I do hope it will not be long before I see you again, he said loudly enough for Edith to overhear. Leah also stood. Oh, Sir Henry, I am sure we will see each other frequently. There was no indication in her voice or manner that their conversation had been anything but a pleasant discussion of the weather. Henry marveled at her. It has gotten quite late, Leah, Edith said. Henry could not help scowling at the handmaid. He felt that she was a constant wedge between Leah and himself, as though she were trying to keep them apart. He wondered if she knew of his former profession of love to Leah and her sound rejection of him. As she was Leah's closest confidant, he had to assume that she did. How mortifying to know that she was discussing his most personal humiliations with anyone whom she saw fit. He found himself really disliking the small blonde girl. My goodness, it has grown late. We must be off at once. Leah said her farewells to Henry, and she and Edith departed through the main doors. Henry sat down again at the table, drinking long into the night, thinking about all that had transpired in his life. He marveled that after three years of grisly combat, he could be exactly where he was prior to his departure from Donning Court, stewing over a woman. You need to rest, Henry told himself. You are exhausted. But with sleep came dreams. He hesitated a moment and reached for the bottle of wine. Chapter 9 I was very happy to see you at the party, Henry said to Roland several days later. They were walking through the gates of Donning Castle's fifty-foot inner wall that surrounded the castle and courtyard, headed in the direction of the outer wall. Historically, the inner wall was Donning Castle's primary defense, but at the height of the Donning's power, their lands and population were growing so rapidly that Braden was forced to commission a second wall, a much larger wall that enclosed Donning Court's vast tracts of land and housing for the tens of thousands of knights, nobles, thanes, franklins, valanes, and serfs. Due to the scope of this project, the second wall was much more modest in height, only half as tall as the inner wall, and offered only moderate protection to those housed within it. Before Braden's reign had ended, however, the second wall had also proved insufficient at containing those who continued to pour into Donning Court to swear fealty to the most powerful baron in all of Europe. As a result, another large group of tenants had coalesced into a town of sorts outside the walls. I am very happy to see you, but I must confess, I had expected to see more than just you upon my return. Shall we not call upon Alder, Charles, and the others? 
Henry's lanky friend was lean like himself, but a head taller, and though Henry had never felt himself particularly agile or dexterous, Roland's coordination was even more challenged outside of the lists. He was thoroughly awkward in manner and speech, and any discomfort felt in a given situation only served to exacerbate this awkwardness. But he had proved a faithful friend to Henry, and Henry felt deeply the absence of friends at the moment. Oh, um, Roland hesitated. Roland, what is it? Henry asked, amused by his friend's discomfort. It is just that... Roland stopped and scratched the back of his corn silk hair. I assumed you would have already been made aware. Made aware of what? Henry asked. Well, Adler is dead. What? Henry stopped and looked at his friend, searching for some sign that this was an ill-judged jest. Roland fidgeted nervously under the scrutiny. I had no idea. Roland nodded. He never returned from the Crusades. Henry resumed walking again to combat the nausea roiling in his stomach. What of Charles and Zachary and the others? Are they dead too? No, no, Roland assured his friend. They are not dead, at least not so far as I am aware. So where are they? Are you the only friend that I have left? An uncomfortable silence followed. That was a jest, Henry protested in dismay. N no, I am certain their friendship is as true and abiding as it ever was, Roland said. So where are they? Henry asked, suddenly in a sour mood. Uh, they are gone, Henry. They have all moved on. Donning Court's economy has been struggling, and they have been forced to offer their swords elsewhere. Are they so mercenary that they sell their allegiance to the highest bidder? Henry growled. Well, Henry, they came back from the Holy Land ready to be knighted and take an oath of fealty, but Donningcourt would not offer them anything. They would have had to stay out of good will, and that is difficult to live on. That does not sound right, Henry said defensively. My father was known for his generous nature almost as much as his thundering hand, and I am certain my mother has continued in that same spirit of generosity. Yes, well... Roland said awkwardly, scratching the back of his head again and averting his gaze. "'Well, what?' Henry demanded. "'Your father is no longer with us, is he?' "'Just what are you implying?' Roland held his hands up defensively. "'Whether real or imagined, it is taken for granted by the locals that the dawning largesse ended with the death of your father.' "'Are you suggesting that my mother?' he sputtered on the words. "'I am not suggesting anything.' "'Or accusing anyone of anything,' Roland said quickly. "'I am only saying that the local economy is depressed "'and that there is very little remuneration offered to knights "'that would otherwise willingly align themselves with Donningcourt.' "'You seem to be doing well enough,' Henry accused. "'Roland only shrugged. "'That is incident to my family's prosperity "'more than my own choice of benefactors.' "'Henry opened his mouth to argue again, "'but closed it without saying anything.' Nothing he was hearing made sense to him, but Roland had no reason to lie. There must be more afoot than he realized. He could not imagine his mother selfishly depriving the chivalry their just rewards. It is not the same, is it? Roland asked knowingly as he again fell in step with his old friend. Coming back, I mean. I remember when I returned, I felt like I had learned a great many things and changed as a person, but everyone here wanted me to be the same person that had left and they were not happy that I was not. I could not be myself, but neither could I be the person that had left years before. I was not happy. It was a challenging time. Perhaps that is what weighs on me, Henry said. I just never imagined it being so different. I am a stranger here, and nobody really knows me. What did you finally do to overcome the awkwardness? You run away and you never come back, Roland grinned, but seeing that Henry did not appreciate the jest, he shrugged and said, You get through it. Once you are back in a routine, everyone will realize that you are not the person that left, and you will realize that you are still the person that left, and everything will be fine. Henry sighed. I hope so. It just seems so foreign. It makes me want to be back on the battlefield. At least there I understood the rules. Yes, well, do not flee quite yet. Give us a chance, Roland said, but he was already looking down an adjacent road. Well, this is where our paths diverge. They said the brief farewells of friends that know they shall soon meet again, and Henry continued on alone. He had been going to repay a visit Thomas had made to him the day before while Henry was away, but on arriving at Thomas's house, Annie, his wife, said that Thomas was most likely drinking with John. That meant a reluctant visit to the serf's quadrant. 
Henry turned off the main lane, walked down an alley, and entered onto the road upon which John had resided when Henry had last been to visit him. A few steps later, Henry cringed from the smell that assaulted him. A putrid stench emanated from the dilapidated cottages. A ditch overflowing with the surf's waste ran down the center of the road. Flies and vermin buzzed and skittered everywhere. Henry gagged and had to suppress an urge to retch. How could anyone live like this? He wondered as he dug in his tunic for a kerchief he could press over his nose and mouth. Especially a nobleman. When Annie had told him that Thomas was with John, Henry had at first been excited to see his eldest brother again after all this time. But now he found himself hoping that she was wrong and that nobody was at home. Henry reached the cottage that, as far as he could remember, belonged to John. All the cottages were identical one-room shanties that had been built while his father was still alive, so he could not be sure he had the right place. But regardless, he knocked. A short, chubby, moon-faced woman opened the door. Her dark, dry hair hung in an unkempt tangle past her shoulders. Having only just come from Thomas's house and speaking with Annie, Henry was struck by how similar the two women's features were. Lindsay? he ventured uncertainly, slowly lowering the kerchief from his nose. She nodded. Hello, Henry, she said in a mousy voice. Ah, uh, hello. He could see into the shabbily furnished cottage and had a vision at once of how she and John must be living. He was immediately uncomfortable. How does this day find you, lady? He is not here, Lindsay said simply. Um, yes, in the fields, then. John does not go into the fields any more, ever since the crop failed. The crop failed? Henry asked, looking beyond the cottages to the amber fields of wheat in every direction. Our crops failed, Henry. Your crops? My father, a villain, gave us one of his fields to work so that we would have something to live on. Lindsay laughed bitterly. My nobleman husband, with all his breeding and education, could not even manage to bring in enough of a crop to feed the two of us. Even the lowliest serf can manage that. Lindsay, you should not be telling me this. The surprise was evident in his voice. Why? Lindsay folded her arms. What have I got to lose? What are you or he going to take from me that he has not already taken? Lindsay, it is not appropriate for a lady, wife to air her grievances in this way. Is that what you are concerned about? Or are you just concerned that the dawning name might get tarnished? She shook her head. You are just like John. He acts so high and mighty, but at the end of the day he is not even as good as a lowly peasant. Henry was stunned by her language. Lindsay, you may not speak to me this way. I am a noble. Lindsay only stared at him while he recovered himself. She was not bright. He remembered that well. The rules of decorum often escaped her, but he did not remember the bitterness that was now overflowing from her. I did not come here to be abused by a serf, he snapped, his indignation starting to replace his shock. Villain, she interjected sternly. It makes no difference. I am a dawning. You work my land and you are indentured to my family. His forceful tone cowed her at last and she dropped her eyes. Henry wiped his hands on his tunic as if they had been soiled. I only came here for Thomas and John. Tell me where I might find them. Lindsay shrugged but did not look up. You do not know where they are or you do not want to tell me? John and I fought this morning and he left. He did not say where he was going, but if he is with Thomas, I am sure they are at Ye Old Crusader, the tavern in the square. That is where they usually are when they are together. Thank you, Henry said with relief. I am sorry to have imposed on you. He turned and began walking away. Lindsay started out the door after him. I am not your property, she called. I am married to a dawning. That makes me a lady. Henry turned back to her slowly. You are married to the disavowed son of dawning court. That makes you nothing. As if to punctuate this sentiment, he again raised his kerchief to his nose before turning away. Henry followed the dirt roads out of the surf's quadrant and into the cobbled lanes of the town square. Ye Old Crusader was a small cottage that had been converted for use as a tavern. It was patronized mostly by the local farmers and tenants of Donning Court, and it was not a nice place by any standards. Henry was sure there was some mistake. This was certainly no place for a nobleman. As he approached the door, he heard raucous laughter coming from inside. He hesitated, his hand halfway to the door. 
He was certain this was not the place where he wanted to have a reunion with his brothers. Nonetheless, he had taken pains to arrive, and if his brothers were inside, he would go in as well. Taking a deep breath, he swung the door open. The inside of the pub matched the outside, dark and dirty. There were a few tables placed haphazardly about the room, and a bar along the back wall tended by a fat bartender in a filthy apron. The man blended in with the elaborate tapestry of filth. He was absently wiping the counter with a rag that was merely spreading the grime. It was early afternoon, and there were only a couple of locals slouched over the bar in a drunken stupor. Henry was disappointed to see Thomas and John sitting across from each other at a table in the center of the room. John had not turned out to greet Henry on his return, an act that was not altogether surprising given his current estrangement from Martha, but seeing him now for the first time, Henry was struck by his altered appearance. He had put on a great deal of weight. His skin was splotchy and his brow darkened. Clearly the years had not been good to him. Thomas and John were not alone at their table. Two women as seedy as the pub itself sat side by side on one side of the table. These ladies, who were almost certainly fixtures of the place, each wore a low-cut gown that revealed a generous amount of cleavage. Several empty wine bottles littered the table, and another, mostly empty bottle, stood next to John. He and Thomas were talking boisterously and laughing louder and louder at each successive comment either of them made. The clamor they were making was accentuated by the shrill laughter of the women who accompanied them. The group was well on its way to complete stupefaction. Henry turned to go before he was spotted, but it was too late. "'Well, if it is not the hero of Cresson,' John called. His words were slightly slurred, and he was squinting through bleary eyes. "'Have you come to rescue us, hero?' Henry was deeply unsettled, seeing his brother sitting uninhibited, without a trace of shame. Evidently, their decision to drink themselves into oblivion was not merely a rare lapse in judgment, but a routine with which they were very familiar. He was not prepared for this.' Henry reluctantly approached the table, feeling every inch the little brother who knew he was in for some verbal abuse at the hands of his elder brothers, but who also knew that the punishment for refusing to obey would be far greater. He had to actively remind himself that he was no longer a helpless victim, but a knight, a leader, and a respected member of the nobility. I have nothing to fear at the hands of these two, he thought as he steeled himself for the attack. It does not look as though you need saving, Henry shot back at John. Both of you are doing an excellent job of running away on your own. To running away, John said, holding up his cup of wine and sloshing some of the cheap dark liquid over the side. Thomas held his cup up as well. He who drinks to run away lives to drink another day. Everyone at the table laughed heartily before messily draining their cups. "'Sit down! Sit down!' Thomas ordered Henry, indicating an unused chair on the opposite side of the table from the women. Henry pulled the chair back and inspected its dirty surface before sitting. He sat upright, pushed back from the table with his legs crossed so that he might remain aloof from what was transpiring before him. "'So what brings Donning Court's golden boy to a cruddy little place like this?' Thomas asked, refilling all their cups." I came to be with my brothers for the first time in three years, Henry said pointedly, hoping they would understand. They did not. I had no idea they had turned into lushes in my absence. Lushes? Why, because we decided to have a drink today? Thomas was suddenly angry. Henry indicated the empty bottles lying on the table. This was just a casual drink on the spur of the moment, was it? It takes an awful lot of practice to be able to imbibe this much. Well... We had some help, Thomas said, reaching over and pinching one of the ladies on the bottom. Henry could not hide his disgust as he looked at the harlots. Their hair was matted. They attempted to hide their age and blemishes with cloying amounts of makeup, and their exposed flesh, rather than tantalizing, gave off an air of rottenness. Hmm. And how do Lindsay and Annie feel about this help? Do not mention those names in here, John ordered. If we were not married, we would not have to drink. "'You are married?' the woman closest to John squealed in a thick Irish brogue. "'If we had known that, we would have charged extra!' She let out a great shrieking laugh that hurt Henry's ears. "'It is no wonder that you are Martha's golden boy,' John said. "'You are exactly like her. A person does one little thing of which you do not approve, and they are trash, good for nothing but to be ground under your heel.' "'To the golden boy of Dawning Court,' Thomas said, again raising his cup. The others followed suit, and they drank. 
Maybe Martha would be a better person if she had the occasional drink, John suggested as Thomas stared into the bottom of the now empty wine bottle. It was clear he did not quite grasp what he was seeing. Of course, look how much good it has done you two. What do you mean? John said, his eyes narrowing at Henry. We are just having a little fun. This does us no harm, but our mother definitely needs something because she has a whole lot of problems. Wine! Thomas called, crashing the bottle down on the table. Murray, wine! Say, you want a drink? He asked, glancing at Henry and again slamming the bottle down. Henry winced from the noise. No, thank you, he turned back to John. The only thing that I can see that our mother lacks is noble sons. You should be tending to her and ensuring that her final years are spent in comfort rather than anxiety over her useless children. Murray arrived with another pitcher of wine. It is on that fellow's tab, of course, John indicated, a tall, lean Saracen merchant that was hunched over the bar, ready to pass out. Murray nodded and retreated quickly. Take care of her. She threw me out. Refused to even let me reside at the castle in my rightful place. But that will change. All that will change. He trailed off, muttering to himself. What will change? John squinted at Henry, the gears of his mind grinding slowly through the alcoholic fog that was settled over it. What are you doing to take care of her? He challenged. You are her golden boy, the one she loves best. Is her life much improved under your loving protection? Ah, uh, yes, Henry assented. It is only reasonable that in the four days since I have returned that I should have a lot more to show for myself than you do after eleven years. He leaned forward. You are her eldest son, the birthright, the heir. And yes, that means all the responsibility goes to you. So much depended upon you and your good decisions, and yet you have consistently failed. Oh, and you are so righteous, Thomas jumped in after refilling the cups from the fresh bottle. What happened to that young man that jumped into everything bad that came along? I never did half the things you did when I was young, and now we indulge a little, and you are so much better than us. Ah, uh, that would be William you are talking about. Henry sat back, surprised at how unpleasant the memory of his younger brother and his misspent youth still was to him. Oh, that is right, John said. William was the malefactor. You were neither good nor bad. You did nothing. You did not live at all. So we drink, Thomas continued. We drink to forget. We drink to take our minds off the terrible things that happened to us. What terrible things? Thomas looked at John for support. Our wives, John said, raising his cup. Yes, Thomas confirmed. To our wives, the plague sent from the underworld to scourge us for our sins. And to cause us to sin more, John added. And they both laughed and drained their cups. So you have made a lot of bad decisions in life that have left you unhappy. And have your good decisions made you happy, Henry? Thomas interrupted. The question brought Henry up short. What had his desire to always be morally responsible brought him? Did he have the company of the woman he loved? Did he enjoy the pleasure of the reputation of which he had always dreamt? All he really had were a bunch of painful memories and nightmares that would not leave him. Well, if it is happiness you are looking for, one of the women rose from her seat and beckoned at Henry suggestively. Everyone but Henry laughed. So you have made a lot of bad decisions that have left you unhappy, Henry repeated. I am sure the choice to forget your troubles by becoming useless sots will bring you the self-respect you have failed to achieve thus far. That seems reasonable. Go to hell, golden boy, Thomas said. John raised his cup and they both drank to that. The trollop, encouraged by their laughter, made her way around the table and leaned her body against Henry, her ample bosom pressed very near his face. Henry tried to avoid acknowledging her. "'If it is experience you are looking for,' she breathed into his ear, "'I will make sure you never forget this.' She stuck her tongue in his ear. Henry shot up out of his seat, dumping the woman to the floor. He was blushing furiously. "'I came here, hoping to find my brothers, but I see they are not here.' I hope for your sakes you have no recollection of this tomorrow, but I will not forget it. He slid his chair into the table to hide any evidence of the fact that he had been there. 
I cannot tell you how sad I am to see how low you have fallen. We did not fall, John said, looking at Thomas. No, Thomas added. We walked arm in arm down here. They both laughed and drank again. You two do bring out the best in each other. Henry exited the pub to cries of, To the golden boy of Dawning Court, may you never lose your luster, and loud drunken laughter. He felt very much alone as he made the trek back home.